All right, since we're getting towards the end of the day, I'm just going to jump right into it. <clears throat> uh, in February of 1745, 48-year-old wealthy spinster Gertrude Savile, a London resident, recorded payment for 17 yards of green damask fabric along with gold trimming for a dress. Over the ensuing 12 years, this green damask reappeared at least nine times in her account books, relating a distinctive narrative of reuse and repurposing. This finding allows us to trace the social biography of a specific set of garments within the life of an individual woman. And while it cannot be fully applied as a universal pattern, each instance the damask resurfaced parallels other records in the account books in the account book and is reflected in innumerable occurrences within the lives and relationships of other 18th century women and their clothing. Uh, uh, oops, went too far. There we go. However, before we begin to unpack her wardrobe, it will be helpful to familiarize ourselves with Gertrude Savile, the person. Much of this comes from Amanda Vickery's book, Behind Closed Doors, wherein I first encountered Savile. Using diaries Savile wrote in her youth and early adulthood, Vickery paints a portrait of an intelligent, creative young woman, but also melancholy to the point of morose, embittered and frustrated over her living and financial situation. She was born in 1697, the daughter and sister of wealthy baronets seated at Rufford Abbey, Nottinghamshire. Her father died when she was but three years old without making any formal arrangements for her financial provision, thus leaving her dependent upon her brother 18 years her senior. As she passed from adolescence into adulthood, she found her dependent situation increasingly intolerable. In her diaries, Savile vented that her brother, Sir George, had a vast estate and I have nothing, and without a set allowance, felt she had to grovel to him for every gown, suit of ribbons, pair of gloves, every pin and needle. She routinely recorded her mood in her diary, usually as unhappy, very unhappy, even miserable. Her needlework and her cat supposedly constituted her only pleasures and solace in life. Although her situation seemed to improve beginning in 1717 when her brother regularized her finances with a 3,000 pound dowry and 80 pound annual allowance, her residence and friction with her family continued. <clears throat> However, in a plot twist worthy of a novel or film, Gertrude inherited an independent fortune in 1730 from a cousin. She later received maternal property at the deaths of her mother and sister. Combined, these afforded her a highly comfortable independence the rest of her life and enabled her to become mistress of her own household at the age of 40. At this point, Vickery mostly leaves Gertrude, the main drama of her life apparently concluded. However, it is precisely from this point that I became most interested in her. For do we not all wonder what happens after happily ever after? Savile's account books, started in 1736, give us some clues. For the next 20 years, until shortly before her death in 1758, Gertrude recorded the expenditures of her independent life in minute detail. Vickery believes Savile's diaries indicate that even after attaining independence, she renounced the Beaumont with a self-pitying sneer, indicated by her report of debauchery in London. And having copied the harlot's progress in silk embroidery on chair covers. Vickery appears to have taken a cursory journey through, her first through the first five months of Savile's account books while she resided in Nottinghamshire. Vickery interprets Savile's accounts as reflecting an ambivalence about fashion, making both old-fashioned and a la mode furnishings and, furnishing and decorating purchases, and that they are indicative of a woman with a developed appreciation of the visual and a determination to beautify the first home she could call her own, while the lack of new entertaining apparatus suggests her interiors were a recess from the world and her material culture not contrived for a social welcome or exhibition. This may be a credible assessment of Savile's life in Nottinghamshire, but her London life appears rather different. She traveled to London for the social season for several years and moved there permanently after her brother's death in 1743, at which point she bought her own and last house in fashionable Great Russell Street's uh, in Bloomsbury. There, she indulged in lavish clothing and accessories. For what did she need all this, including two formal court robes, if she never saw anyone or went out? 
There were also purchases of theater tickets and inferences to friends and other social participation suggesting she was, at least, not an entirely morose recluse. My talk today stems from one particular purchase, the 17 yards of green damask she bought in February 1745 to make a gown. At 14 shillings per yard, it totaled almost 12 pounds, a considerable amount at the time. Two days later, she, spent, she paid a further 12 pounds for gold trimming. Savile does not specify the textile's origin. However, it was purchased in London during the peak of the Spitalfield silk industry. The possibility exists. It was even woven to a design by Anna Maria Garthwaite. Partially thanks to this famed textile designer, English silk brocades and damasks of the second quarter of the 18th century differ in style from French ones, enabling us to conjecture the general style of Savile's damask if it was of local origin. While Garthwaite was more known for her silk brocade designs, particularly colorful and realistically rendered florals, she did also design damasks. The two examples shown here are believed to be her designs, and note that they are both green. Shortly after, in March, she, record, she recorded paying a sack maker 16 shillings for making the dress and applying the gold trim. The final cost of the ensemble totaled over 25 pounds, an extravagant sum for a single outfit, exclamation point. The highly fashionable sack, or robe a la Française, was characterized by the distinctive stacked box pleats that fell freely from the shoulders, creating a gracefully billowing back. The dress would have had an open bodice front filled in with a stomacher, and at the time she bought it, could have had either the pleated wing cuffs at the ends of the sleeves, or the incoming falling cuffs, comprising one, two, or three tiers of gathered flounces. The gold trim she purchased was likely used to augment pleated or gathered trimmings made from the dress fabric, applied to the stomacher, bodice, and skirt front edges, and front of the matching petticoat, with serpentine designs particularly popular at this time. The fabric, used to make, um, the fabric used made for a formal ensemble meant for dinners, balls, and other ceremonial events, except those of court. Both design and textile suggest she did participate in London's social life, uh, oh, I didn't mean to go there yet, uh, at least to some degree. Although Savile probably also indulged in finery to please herself, especially considering her earlier complaint of having to beg every scrap of clothing from her brother during her dependency. While sacks were the standard style of fashionable dress for women in France by the mid-1740s, this was less so in England. There, the fitted back style, most often referred to in the period as a nightgown, was the standard mode. This was so much the case that abroad it became known as the English gown, evolving into the robe à l'anglaise towards the end of the century. Nightgowns were worn by women of all social positions and could be either for everyday wear or formal events. The intersection of social class and material use dictated where it fell on these spectrums. For example, a plain silk or printed linen nightgown might be the Sunday or best dress for a woman of modest means, while the same would be an everyday dress for a more affluent woman. Sack dresses were somewhat more special than even fancy nightgowns and were meant to be seen. Savile also commissioned and had altered several hoop petticoats, the foundation garment that created the exaggeratedly wide skirt silhouette of the period. The first appearance of one in her accounts is in April 1737 when she paid one pound seven shillings for a new one, not a cheap item. In the 1740s, this fashion, this fashion actually reached its most extreme proportions, and Savile's records appear to reflect this. She recorded purchasing a French hoop petticoat for just less than two pounds in March 1744. The French designation would seem to suggest a garment at the forefront of fashion. However, even more suggestive are the entries recorded recording payment for widening a quilted silk petticoat on the same bill as the French hoop and putting a breadth into worked quilted petticoat in June of that year. These indicate that fashion and fashionability were important to Savile, providing further suggestive evidence that she either dressed, either, she either desired or felt compelled to follow the reigning fashions of London society and that she participated in the social life of her class. Furthermore, while she wasn't afraid to pay for it, viz. the French hoop, she wasn't going to waste what she already had either. But why this gown and why at this date? It was the most expensive sack she ever purchased. 
In fact, it was the costliest dress or ensemble overall that appeared in her account books. The total price of this outfit exceeded even the court robe she acquired in 1747 at 20 pounds and six shillings. That the green damask sack, a style of slightly lower status than a court robe, was the costlier of the two, suggests just how much Saville prized it. Surely this was more than coincidental, and I have a theory. It may be explained by one particular occurrence in her life shortly before its acquisition, buying and becoming mistress of her own house. Saville acquired the green damask shortly, shortly following her move to Great Russell Street. Her accounts over the final few months of that year record a great many expenditures related to newly fitting it up. This was also her first season in London as a permanent resident. Home ownership, particularly in London, was, highly was a highly unusual and, ex uh, and exceptional thing for anyone to achieve, let alone a woman, and a single woman at that, even within her exalted social sphere. Gertrude Saville may have experienced a particularly keen sense of pride and joy in this, considering how unhappy and unwelcome she had felt in the homes she shared with her family. Saville may well have indulged in this, in this extravagantly luxurious ensemble in connection to such a momentous occasion. In addition to its monetary value, such an association can also help explain the Green Damask's numerous reappearances in her account books. The first of these are for relatively minor alterations. Two and a half years after the initial purchase, Saville bought robings and facing for it, and almost a week later recorded having them set onto the gown. Robings, the folded strips of fabric running down bodice front edges from shoulder to waist, framing the stomacher, were usually cut in one with the bodice fronts. However, they were sometimes separate pieces. Most dresses featured matching robings, but contrasting ones also existed. Most likely, Saville chose to replace the robings for aesthetic reasons, while the new facings may have been a maintenance-related replacement. This likely helped maintain the sack's status as a formal ensemble in her wardrobe rather than diminishing it. A year later, Saville recorded making sleeves to green sack. This entry refers to the cost of labor only with no corresponding purchase of fabric, suggesting it was executed with material left over from the sack's original construction. The reason for replacing the sleeves is not mentioned. However, wear is a reasonable possibility. Sleeves were relatively fitted and cut high under the arm. Consequently, the underarm area is one particularly vulnerable to the combined effects of perspiration and abrasion. This is also the only instance in Saville's account books of replacing only sleeves for a pre-existing dress. I cannot help but wonder if this entry, entry might indicate that she wore this ensemble more frequently than others. A year after the sleeve replacement, Saville paid for a pair of green damask shoes trimmed with gold. Dress fabrics were frequently used in making fashionable shoes, particularly women's. It is highly possible the green damask and gold trimming were the same as her sack, using more leftover material from the initial purchase, or possibly from the original sleeves if enough usable material remained. That they were also trimmed with gold begs the question of whether the shoes were made specifically to be worn with the sack. The first major reworking of the garment occurred in December 17... 51, when Saville recorded a green damask sack made into a nightgown. This involved completely disassembling the dress and recutting it. In addition to fitted bodices, nightgowns also featured a peculiar cut and construction whereby the center back portion of the bodice was cut in one with the center back skirt panel, while the rest of the dress had a waist seam. This is known today as en ferro. In addition to marking distinctions of rank, the textile used could also denote the level of formality within a woman's wardrobe. A nightgown of printed linen was less showy and formal than one of silk damask. However, nightgowns of any material were typically considered less formal than sacks. Thus, while Saville's green damask maintained significant status after its transformation from a sack into a nightgown by virtue of the material, it did likely move down in rank from a very formal garment to one less so, more suited to day wear, dining at home, visiting or entertaining friends, rather than very formal social engagements. There are several possible reasons for this alteration. The green damask fabric may have been damaged in some way or started to show visible wear. 
Typically, fitted back dresses, such as nightgowns, did not require quite as much fabric as sack dresses. So potentially damaged or worn areas could be cut away with still enough fabric left over for a full dress. Another option is that the textile pattern was no longer sufficiently fashionable for the formal public occasions that usually dictated wearing a sack dress ensemble. Finally, this may be an early indication of Saville retreating from society as she grew older and her health failed. This was not the first sack she had turned into a nightgown. Two years earlier, in December 1749, she had a French silk sack turned into a nightgown. And in the years after the green damask was restyled, other, several other sacks received the same treatment. Additionally, Saville acquired only one new sack after the green damask was remade, one of scarlet satin in December 1754. All other account book entries relating to sacks from 1752 onwards regard having them remade into nightgowns. Of course, none of these possibilities are mutually exclusive. More than one, if not all, could have formed part of the decision. About 11 individual sack dresses can be discerned within Saville's account books compared with approximately 60 nightgowns. The time period during which sacks appear in the account books is suggestive. The first mention of them is the purchase of the green damask in 1745. The final for purchasing or making one is in 1754, spanning the first nine years of her permanent residence in London. Considering that sacks were largely associated with formal occasions, the disappearance of them from her account books after 1754 may point to Saville's retirement from social life in her final years. Additionally, most, if not all, of the sack dresses eventually were made into nightgowns. Indeed, Saville continued to have new nightgowns made and old ones altered or remade up until just a few months before her death. Most of these were also made from costly silks. Evidently, she remained interested in fine clothing towards the end of her life, but the sack dress may no longer have suited her lifestyle. Three more pairs of green damask shoes appeared in the accounts between December 1753 and January 1754. The first of these entries was for two pairs and relates the missing word was my own. The missing word of the entry was probably cloth. As mentioned, nightgowns require less fabric than sack dresses. Thus, the conversion from one to the other would leave more than enough material for covering multiple pairs of shoes. The, the fourth pair was also trimmed with gold like the first and was given to a Miss Dowling. This was probably still more of the leftover material and also gold, tri gold trimming. That the shoes were a gift invokes additional tantalizing questions such as how a new pair of shoes made from old used materials were perceived by the recipient. Did this denote particular intimacy or merely expedience? Had Miss Dowling admired Saville's green damask or did she possess clothing of her own that, that Saville thought green damask shoes would suit? Nearly six years after turning the sack into a nightgown, Saville recorded new making a green damask nightgown, along with paying for sleeve lining, gimp, and a heart's horn and bread to clean it. This indicates a full refurbishment and cleaning to update and refresh the dress, still within the context of a nightgown. The term new making means that, once again, the dress was entirely disassembled, although this time reassembled into the same style. In addition to replacing the sleeve linings and performing some specialty cleaning, alterations for size or fashion may also have been performed. The body of the garment may have been altered for size as it had been almost six years since its prior remodeling, and a stylistic change or two may also have been made. Over the 1750s, skirt widths reduced significantly from their extreme proportions of the 1740s. The green damasks skirt, ooh, may have been reduced at the time it was made from a sack into a nightgown and or Saville may have taken the opportunity of this subsequent refurbishing to trim it down. The purchase of gimp indicates that new trim was added, less fine than the gold trim that initially decorated the damask as a sack. Finally, according to household manuals of the time, Hartshorn was a common cleaning agent used to spot treat as a spot treatment for silks. It was made from the horns of young bucks or hearts and has been likened to the forerunner of baking soda. The bread was used to apply and remove the heart's horn. The gown's final appearance in the account books is 21 January 1757 when Saville recorded making green damask into a wrapping gown, bespeaking the garment's removal from public life entirely. 
This is also the final appearance of the green damask fabric in the account books, which end just over a year later, shortly before Savile's death. Wrapping gowns, the 18th century equivalent to house coats or dressing gowns, were informal, often loosely fitted garments worn only in the home. They could be worn in the morning before cleaning, uh, completing one's full dressing, when indisposed, in the evening after beginning undressing for the night, or any time one wished to relax at home. To create the looser fit, Savile's green damask nightgown was likely completely unpicked yet again and remade using primarily fabric from the dress skirt and petticoat. Most of the bodice pieces were likely too small to reuse for this purpose. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead since I am running out of time, I'm afraid. I'm sorry. Uh, I spoke a little too slowly at the beginning, I guess. Um, so I'm going to skip over to um, life after Savile's death. The ultimate fate of Gertrude Savile's green damask is unknown. However, such a rich textile, well cared for over more than a decade, was unlikely to have been simply discarded after Savile's death. It would have gone somewhere to someone. It may have passed to a servant or to her niece Barbara, her brother's daughter, of whom she was fond. If the former were the case, it was likely sold in the second-hand clothing market. If the latter befell the green damask, a different outcome was possible. Clothing passed down from an older woman to a younger relative could have been remade for their personal use. In fact, one such example involves a green damask gown. In the early 1780s, Parson Woodford of the famous diary gave to his own niece, Nancy, such a gown of his Aunt Parr's that had passed to him. It was remade and worn at home with, with her uncle, for whom she kept house. It would have been altered both to fit Nancy and update the style as it was already several decades old and quite unfashionable for the 1780s. And more than one green damask gown survives in museum collections whose textiles date from the time of Gertrude Savile's but was made over in the 1780s. I examined one in person in the collection at Platt Hall in Manchester and found another at the Met Museum in New York. Here, <laughs> the example pictured uh, here. Unfortunately, I have been unable to track down a will for Gertrude Savile, although I did find her mother's and her brother's, and I am desperately still seeking for hers. So I have no idea whether she would have specified the green damask in a bequest or have mentioned her clothing at all. However, we do know that she was fond of her niece and nephew, her brother's children, and that she gave clothing gifts to her niece in life. Considering the money she spent both on acquiring a large, sumptuous wardrobe and its upkeep over time, it seems reasonable to suppose that she would have taken some care regarding its disposal after her death. It is possible some or all of it went to servants. However, she had a high turnover rate of these in her household, making it difficult to develop relationships that would lead to this outcome. I like to think it more likely that her clothing passed largely to her niece Barbara and that the green damask continued its life with her in some form, at least as a physical connection to and reminder of Aunt Gertrude, it having been such a fixture in her wardrobe for so many years. Thank you.